Thanks for checking out this no spoilers movie review for the film Blood and Black Lace, which is an old Italian giallo film done by Mario Bava that was done in 1964. Uh, real quick off the bat, obviously the scenery behind me is much different than what people are used to and the audio is different because there's a lot more of an echo. Uh, I'm doing this review because I'm kind of late on getting it out. I wanted to get it out earlier, but um, doing vacation stuff. And uh, yeah, when you're doing vacation and you want to do a video like this, you kind of just work with whatever you have. So where we're staying is what I got, you know. So the lighting's not the best and the um, audio's not the best because there's a lot of echo here. So I apologize for that, but the review, the content should be quite good. I just finished watching Blood and Black Lace, which, by the way, if anyone watched my uh, review of Dario Argento's Deep Red, that was the first of the Giallo films I've done reviews for for this uh, YouTube channel. And so I put out a poll. Uh, I've been doing a poll through a Facebook group, but I've also been asking people if they have certain films that they want me to do, they want to vote for the next one, they can put it down in the comments. So you can certainly feel free to do that. And I'm mainly just trying to do films that are available on Shudder, on the Shudder Horror Streaming Service. So uh, if you have Shudder, you'll know for sure. Otherwise, you can just take a shot and say, oh, I'd really like this film. Maybe it's on there. Just put it down there. But at any rate, subscribe for me. That would be great. I would really appreciate that. Once again, sorry for the acoustics and the lighting. But let's talk about Blood and Black Lace. This film actually, and I said it during my Deep Red review, uh, is the number one rated Giallo film on InternetMovieDatabase.com or IMDB.com as most people know it. Um, yeah, so it's the number one. I, that having been said, I will say right off the bat, I liked this film. I thought it was a good film, but I liked Deep Red a lot more. Deep Red came in in the top, um, I think, like 50 Giallo films as number 13, and Blood and Black Lace was number one. And I'm thinking the main reason for that is that Blood and Black Lace was well before Deep Red. I think at least mm, about 10 years, somewhere in that realm. It may have been actually a little bit more uh, than 10 years before Deep Red happened. So I think the reason that Blood and Black Lace is so high is because it kind of got the ball rolling on Giallo in Italy. So that's kind of you know, why I think, because it's one of those nostalgia things. When something gets there first, people tend to think of it as the best, as opposed to, you know, where it would naturally rank with the other films that come well after it. So, that's just my thought. Um, okay, just going to go through this with my notes for how I felt and what came up as I was going through the film. Uh, the introduction is awesome. The way they get it going, it's extremely stylish. It looks very, very good. The colors that they use, they use a lot of different colors in the intro and kind of show a bunch of the different um, characters with, you know, colors that really pop. Like there's some purple, some green, some reds that look really nice. So it's very visually pleasing and it's a really nice way to get you engaged in the film right off the bat. Because for me... Like, it's, it's not just about substance, it's also about style. Now, I don't like just style or just substance, I like it together. Um, so when you start with one of those things and then also have the other thing, it's very nice. And this film does that. Uh, they set a very tense and menacing tone immediately. Uh, they kind of don't waste any time getting to the actual conflict in the story and what's really going on because... You know, being a Giallo film, it's all about who is the killer. So you really have to set up immediately killing, basically. And then let's start unraveling this mystery. Uh, so I really like that, how they, they wasted almost no time. They just got right into it. Because of the time period, these practical effects really didn't look very good. But that's kind of something people need to keep in mind, is that... Um, Practical effects over time, they just got better and better and better and better. Right now, practical effects, what's available at least, is the best it's ever been. Now, does everyone do it that way in their films? No, not necessarily. But when watching much older films like this, I mean, this film is, I mean, it's from 1964. So decades and decades ago, you need to consider that the practical effects, just what were available was not anywhere near what's available today. So just keep that in mind when you're watching older films like this. Uh, another thing just like that is the acting, the acting ability. 
Uh, there's been much more of a focus as the decades have gone on of acting that feels natural, that feels like, oh, this makes sense, uh, as opposed to what it used to be is it used to kind of be more like a go bigger, you know, have more bravado, um, kind of stand out more. It, it was closer to like a stage acting versus what's now film acting. And those types of acting are extremely different if you think about it. Stage acting is more over the top and it's kind of uh, just accepted as that way. Uh, whereas what we've gotten to now with like show and, and movie acting, it's more like this is real life. So um, watching this film, that kind of stood out to me as well. The practical effects for being not so good, but that's you know a product of its time and also the acting. For the time, it was good acting. So, but that also said, where with Deep Red, it was dubbed in English and shot in Italian, so the mouths didn't the mouths did not uh, line up with the words. This one was, I believe, it was shot in Italian, and it it was not it dubbed in English, and there were just subtitles, and the mouths did not match up with the words, which. When it's in subtitles and you're mainly just reading the subtitles, it's not that distracting. But when you look up every now and then and it's another language and the mouths are not matching up with that language, it is kind of distracting and you're just kind of like, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So I don't know. That That's just a small thing. Just a very, very small thing. So um, there are some amazingly framed shots in this. The, uh, the cinematography is really good. The directing is really good. And uh, the set design is really nice. Like I was saying before, like in the intro, it's very stylish and there are a lot of really nice colors that pop. That's one of the big things in this is that the use of colors is really awesome in, in the set. As well as the use of lighting, especially during the night scenes. Which there are plenty of night, night scenes in this film. And the way they, they choose to light certain things and keep certain things in the shadow look really great. And then also on top of that, the fact that they don't always light things in the dark with just regular light, like white light. Sometimes they're lighting it with like purple or like a green or a blue, and it looks really cool. Like I love those stylistic choices, and that's yet just another thing that keeps you engaged in the film. So I really like that. Um, but there were some really awesome shots in the film. There was one in particular that was shot through the handles of a purse there's like a purse sitting on like a counter and the handles the both the handles went up and they kind of like they weren't lined up together it was kind of like one was like this and then the other one was like a little bit over to the side so they made like a little bit of a pattern and then you were the camera was going like kind of through it and there was a woman framed by the handles of the purse that just looked really cool. And then there was stuff on the side going on in the scene. It was really awesome. Like, I really like interesting shots like that. And that one was really nice. But also there were a, a bunch of scenes where they did mirrors. They used mirrors to, like, shoot in the mirror. So initially you don't know that it's being shot in a mirror. And then they just kind of, like, pan away or, like, move up or something. And then you see, oh, this is, was shot in a mirror, and then you go to where the scene's actually going on. I really like stuff like that, too. It's Once again, it's like a stylistic thing. It's very stylish. It's very nice. And, and, and it's fun. It keeps you interested. Because one of the things is, it's not just about having good acting and having good story. If you can keep people engaged with interesting shots, that's just another level. It, and it's super fun, for me, at least. Um Put down in the comments, are you a big fan of interesting shots or you don't care? You're just there for the substance. Um, I, th I would say in this film they did a really good job of making everyone seem potentially guilty. There are a bunch of characters in it who, they don't really go a whole lot into those individual characters, like backstory wise, but that kind of serves the story because you don't want to know too much because it's this whole guessing game of, um, you know, we're slowly unraveling this mystery of who the killer is, and you have a bunch of options, which keeps you guessing, and it's nice. And like I said, they they make a lot of these characters seem potentially guilty, which is great, because then you have a much larger pool, it keeps you guessing longer, it's more engaging, it's more fun. So they did a good job with that, story-wise. 
Uh, I already talked about the lighting. That was my next note. And the acting as well. Um, it, although I, I will say it's really funny with some of these, some of the people who were suspects in this film, they keep acting like, and I just found this really funny. They just keep being like, well, I gave you my alibi. Why can't I go? Like, why are you holding me? Obviously this investigation's over concerning me because I just gave you my alibi. It's kind of this thing of like just assuming that everyone's word is 100% all the time and everyone should act that way. It's just kind of funny because it's not just one character who acts like that. It's kind of multiples. So I don't know. I just kind of found that funny. Um, and then the other thing that that kind of stood out to me with, with how the film was done with the story and the acting is that there's no sympathy really for the people who are close to the deceased in this film. It's kind of like someone dies and then people are just like, yeah, you know, that really sucks. But hey, guess what? We still got to work. Like uh, tomorrow you got to, mm, you better be here at the normal time because we got things to do. And there's absolutely no sympathy for how people connected to the deceased even are feeling or the amount of fear these people have because the killer's still on the loose. Everyone's just like, I mean, come on, just go on with your life and uh, see you tomorrow at work. Let's go. Which I think kind of is applicable now. I think that people, by and large, are more uh, sympathetic when things like that happen. But at the same time, like, work is still like, hey, when are you coming back? You know? Like, it still kind of applies today. Anyway, but that's it, actually. Uh, overall, I did enjoy the film. Like I said, I didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed Dario Argento's Deep Red. But this one's a good one. If you do like Giallo, and this is, you know, super highly rated, I would say definitely check it out. I give it three and a half stars out of five. Um, so I would recommend it. It's pretty solid. So yeah, enjoyed it. Uh, and then let me go ahead. I have three films that I'm considering for my next uh, film review that I'm going to be pulling off of Shudder. So I am going to post that as a poll in my Facebook group. But like I said, you can comment down below what you want. And I will allow people to add to the list. These are just three options to get people started. So you can vote one for one of these or you can throw out your own. Once again, I'm trying to make sure it's from Shudder. So if you don't have Shudder, you can make a guess at if it's on Shudder or not. So I'll count the, the votes from comments down below and then also the poll that I'm putting in this Facebook group. So the, t the three that I've picked out to get things rolling are Heart and Knife. And I don't know if it's actually Heart and Knife or it's Heart plus Knife because it uses a plus sign instead of an ampersand. So I'm assuming it's supposed to be Heart plus Knife, but I think it sounds better as if it's Heart and Knife. But anyway, the film Heart and Knife, in my opinion, uh, which is a relatively recent film. Look up the synopsis if you want to know what that is. Uh, the next one is Inferno, sticking in the uh, giallo realm if people want to. It is Inferno by Dario Argento. And the final one is Time Crimes, which is a Spanish film that is currently streaming on Shudder. So those are your three options. Heart and Knife, Inferno, and Time Crimes. Put a vote down there. And also just comment down there about, have you seen Blood and Black Lace? What are your thoughts on it? Do you want to see it now if you haven't? Let's talk about that. Give me a thumbs up. And like I said, please hit that subscribe. It can mean a lot for me. And it literally takes you a second. Super painless. But thank you so much for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.